With a voice of thanksgiving, we praise you, O God, for all that you are, for all that you've created. Your works are great. You forgive our sins, heal our wounds, you redeem our lives. So compassionate, full of power and grace, through joy and sorrow, you are always there. So let us show our thanks with our sacrifice. Let us sing of your goodness, delight in your love. We give thanks to the Lord. Well, good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Good, 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 good. Good to see you. Last Sunday in November of the year 2021. You only get one of them. One last Sunday in November. This is it. Um, so this morning, we are, as Pastor John mentioned, kind of in a two-part mini-series on always giving thanks. And last Sunday, Pastor John gave a phenomenal message out of the book of Psalms, Psalm 103. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to be in person, present, on location for the teaching last Sunday. I was uh, teaching at another church in Pensacola. However, I did catch it on the podcast and um, was just so encouraged, (sighs) really by what the Word of God has to say. And then it doesn't leave us alone. Do you know what I mean by that? That that the Word of God is is actually helpful. That, That the Word of God brings instruction. And that instruction leads to life not death. I would say there's a lot of instruction, content, communication, presentation of information that is given in today's culture that I'm not sure that its end goal is your benefit in your life and the betterment of you. Everyone has an agenda. Everyone does. God has one. But the great thing about God's agenda is that it's good. It's trustworthy. It's gracious, it's kind. And this morning, as we navigate time in God's word together, we're going to be in the book of Psalm once again, chapter 95. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 95. We, we hope and we plan, and it's in our, our intent this morning, to cover the entirety of this psalm together as we're gathered here in person and online, or perhaps if you're joining us at a later time. It's officially the Christmas season. It's in full swing. So you may say, did you guys miss a beat? Why another Thanksgiving message? What's going on here? Well, I believe we have a full calendar ahead of us. December starts when? And you know know when December starts? Wednesday. It's coming for you. It's coming for you. And it's going to be a full month. I mean, perhaps for you personally or professionally, you've got many different things that you are going to be engaged in. I know for us as a church, we have many different dynamics. You know, this afternoon, in fact, we'll have, you know, a few dozen children up here on stage preparing for different performances with the kids' Christmas choir. We'll have a a cookies in the courtyard event like we've had in years past. We'll have various parties and giving initiatives, just like the one you heard about, to help facilitate ministry and care for those that are in foster care in our local counties. We'll have a Christmas Eve service. It's going to be a full month. And I think that's a good thing. Why? I think it's a good thing to intentionally focus time and attention together, celebrating the faithfulness of God. Because that's truly what Christmas is about. Say, what do you mean by that? Christmas is proof positive of God proving himself faithful on dozens upon dozens of foretellings, prophecies, that he's good to his word. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, God shared through the prophet that there would be one coming who would be unique. How would he be unique? Born of a virgin. Is that guy here? Are you, is it? No, it ain't you. There's one that came that was unique. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, He actually told us where he would be born, Bethlehem. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, we learn that the Messiah would have to spend time in Egypt. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, that he would be called a Nazarene. 
Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, that he would be an heir to the throne of David. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 35, that he would have a preview of coming attraction. He'd have a forerunner. And as, if you've read the New Testament, you go, oh man, Jesus checked every box. How could Jesus have control over where he was born? Did you have that control? No. Did you have control over to whom you were born? No. Could Jesus have manipulated his messiahship? It's a mathematical impossibility. No. He is unique. There's never been anyone like him. And so at Christmas, we make much about Jesus because there's much to be made much about. And I just want to share with you all these things that are going on. You're invited to join us as we celebrate that God is good, God is faithful, there's proof positive. His name is Jesus. But don't you find it easy in the year 2021 not to only lose sight of that in the midst of all that's coming for you in the month of December, but to simply lose sight of the fact of what we took time to do on Thursday, to give thanks. I mean, now it's time to to get stressed, right? Like we give thanks on Thursday, the rest of the year is stress. Like how are we gonna afford this? What about that? How, it's it's a unique, you know, dichotomy there for the American people, It's, it's interesting. But don't you find it easy to lose sight of the ability to frame your attitude with gratitude? But it's gonna have to be something you're intentional about over these next few days. But listen to me. Gratitude is the soil in which joy and peace take root so that they can bear their good fruit in your life. Gratitude is the soil in which things that you really want, peace, self-control, that's the soil of the heart. But those characteristics can plant good roots so that they can bear their good fruit. Without gratefulness, you'll never be able to live with resilient, sustainable joy. Remember, that's what we learned over the last, oh, couple of months together, that who's the key to joy? Jesus. Jesus. Any, any problem with Jesus? No. So then why is a Christian not joyful? Perhaps there's elements of choice involved. And may I have your attention? I don't, I don't know you the way God knows you. I don't know every dynamic of your upcoming days. I don't know what the last week has been like. I don't know what keeps you up at night. I don't know what makes you smile. Jesus does. And I would say this on the authority of God's word. You can choose to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. No matter who you are, where you've come from, what you've done, what you've not done, gratitude can be yours. It can be. It can be. And today we're looking at Psalm 95 in its entirety, and here's what we're going to be learning from God's Word. Two insightful invitations and one very stern warning from God's Word. Two invitations and a warning that if heeded will help us to live well. And listen to me. This is my hope for you as a pastor, that you learn to live well. Psalm chapter one, that that would be descriptive of your life. Not all of it, but the good parts. You know what I'm saying? That, That there's those who delight in the word of God and that over time, their life becomes like a tree. A tree? Yes, a living organism that bears fruit in its season, that's strong, resilient, fruitful, consistent. That's what I want for you. That's that's yours to have if you should choose to follow the Lord. I want Psalm 1 for you. Uh, Jesus, John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I believe as a pastor, as someone who's just a Christian, I want you to have that. 
life that's abundant, life that's full. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17 gives us this great instruction that the word of God has been given to us so that you and I can discern truth from lie, how to get right and how to stay right, how to live well. And today in Psalm 95, we're given both instruction and correction in the form of two invitations and a warning. And if we'll live these lessons, here's what we'll do. You and I, we'll turn thanksgiving into thanks living. Does that make sense? Like we'll be able to live that way. A lifestyle that keeps the soil of our hearts tilled for the fulfillment that only a Christ-centered life offers. I once heard a pastor kind of interviewed, and not really a necessarily like, you know, friendly atmosphere. And the interviewer asked of this pastor, you really believe that your way is the only way, Christians? And he said, absolutely not. I don't believe that. Jesus does. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm just telling you what he said. I'm the messenger. The one who claims with authority to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, the designer of life, except through me. Jesus will always be the key to joy. Jesus will always be better. Jesus will always be the one who rebuilds and restores. Jesus will always be the reason for every season. A Christ-centered life offers fulfillment that no other life can offer. And here's my hope. We're going to spend the next few minutes together in Psalm 95. Here's what I believe after spending time in Psalm 95 this week. This is helpful for you. There's a pathway in Psalm 95 that will help you turn thanksgiving into thanksgiving, if you should so choose. But the choice is yours. Nobody can live your life for you You are responsible for you. So as you take time to consider God's word today, I hope and pray that these invitations, this warning, illuminates your heart to how good God is and how he's made a way for you, not to just get out of hell, but to see his will done on earth as it is in heaven. For that's what you're designed to do. Why don't we do this? Why don't you stand with me? And I'd like to read Psalm 95, verses 1 through 11 in the New Living Translation in its entirety. We'll pray and then we'll kind of look at these two invitations and this warning. Psalm 95, verse 1. This is how it reads. Come, let us sleep through the sermon. No. (laughs) Let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest of mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land too. So come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice tomorrow. Today. Today. For the Lord says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did in Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For there your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did for 40 years. Listen to the Lord's word here. I was angry with them. And I said, they are a people whose hearts turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never Enter 
my place of rest. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that the truth of your word is inerrant, infallible, and inspired. And I pray this morning that it would be inspirational to us and that we would listen so we can learn how to live well from the word of God. And I pray that in the only name that matters, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Two invitations and a warning. Let let me just go ahead and share with you the first invitation. Here it is. We'll even put it up on the screen for you. You're invited. Don't you like those words? Those are always, oh, wow, someone likes me. You're invited to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. See, you know, that doesn't rhyme. It's not short. There's no meter to it. How can I remember this? I don't care about that. I want you to know this. You're invited to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. This is the first invitation where he says, come, you're invited to gather with the people of God. Why? To do what? To sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. Verse 1 and 2, he says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. You're invited. You know, over the last year or so, the staff here has begun to communicate with one another or the teams that they're in or however the dynamic of structure is on value through a tool that we call eval because I believe you don't value what you don't evaluate. Like if you don't spend time reflecting, how did that go? Should we do that vacation again? Should we bake that meal again? Should we go to that church again? If you don't evaluate it, how do you know? You know. Eval. In the eval report that I read from last Sunday from Rob, the worship leader, who by God's grace was able to take a vacation today. I think it's his first or second vacation in like seven years. So thank God for that. That's awesome. But he said, hey, in his eval, he said, Neil, the people were singing so loudly today. It so encouraged our team. And I thought, that's a biblical church. He even said you sounded good. You don't have to do that to be biblical. But he said you sounded good. Which I think, wow, that's awesome. But he said they were singing. Why is that a good thing? Why is that a biblical thing? You know, there's so many more people in life that are smarter than me. My wife says amen to that, but so many, so many. I'm so thankful to learn from so many more that are just so more gifted than I. Some of the people that I read this week on this passage say this, God is to be honored with song, and this is to be done all by yourself, in community. That's what this text teaches us. There are four let us's in those verses there. Let us, let us, let us, let us gather together. This is the biblical model. Another author writes this, singing expresses human thought emotively. And Christianity, this is what what he says, is a feeling religion. Really? More particularly, Singing expresses joy, and the Bible's religion at its heart is a joyful one. Can I say that again? The Bible's religion at its heart is a joyful one. May I have your attention? If you are in Christ, you're not going to hell. That's a good day. At its heart, Christianity is a joyful one. You say, even in the emotions? Yes. Are emotions that which lead us? No. But emotions are important. I think feelings are meant to be felt, not to be stuffed. Didn't you just read Psalm 95? God said, I got anger. There's an emotion there. 
I mean, it's okay to be emotive, absolutely, but always allow everything in life to stay within the confines of God's word. It's not wrong to grieve. This season may bring grief to many of us. You're human. Grieve well. But let the word of God form and fashion how you grieve and why. Another author wrote this. God should be honored with happy, enthusiastic hearts. There is a place for somber, reflective mood and worship. Oh, yes. But it should not be the dominant tone. God's people have much to shout joyfully about. I think that's true. I think you're invited to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. But admittedly, you may not be there today. I don't know how to pronounce it. Omnicron, is that right? Like the new transformer or like whatever it is. Like, There's dynamics, right? You might say, shout joyfully, give thanks. Really? Are you aware of what's going on? COVID has ravaged our world. The labor crisis has inconvenienced our entire life. The stress that I'm experiencing is, is ruining any kind of meaningful relationships I could possibly have. What on earth do I have to be thankful for? Why joy and gratitude in songs of joy? Look at verses 3, 4, and 5. This is why. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest of mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it in his hands form the dry land too. Why? Be thankful and joyful and actually sing? I don't even know how to sing. That's not the qualitative reason. Here's the reason. Because Scripture informs our perspective. And perspective shapes our identity and our activity. Scripture teaches this. God is our God. We can't go into this. But when he says the rock of our salvation, he's not talking, oh, God of the universe cosmic watchmaker who wound everything up and just put everything into existence, who doesn't care. No. Because you're the rock of my salvation. He's our God. And he's both creator and tough. I mean, look at the language there. Great is our God. Great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth, the valleys and the mountains. He's like, I got him right here. Death Valley, it's right here. The sea belongs to him. And the dry land, he he formed it. God's tough. He's strong. He's creator. He's above all gods. What does that mean, that we actually have a polytheistic faith, that there's many gods? No. Everyone has a functional God. The master passion of their life. For some, it's, what do you think of me? That's what's determining everything that I do. For some, it's sport, health, finance. The master passion of your life is your God. And this is what the Word says. He's better than everyone. What do you mean by that? No matter who you run to for security, God is stronger. No matter where you run for satisfaction, God is sweeter. No matter how wise your counselor is, God is wiser. Our circumstances don't mitigate his might and our trials don't diminish his deity. The problems of our world do not soften his sovereignty. He is above. He is God. He is creator. He is tough. That's who God is. He is not your homeboy. Does that make sense? Like, me and God, we're good. He knows that I do stuff and I do, you know, but we're good. God is God. He doesn't need you to sing. He doesn't need you. He wants you. And that's the healthy relationship you want. God wants you. He doesn't need you. He loves you. He cares for you. That's all very true. And many of our songs today can become prom songs to Jesus if we're not careful. And there's a place for that. But also... He's God. 
He's creator. He's tough. He's to be respected, to be worshipped. But that's not the only reason. That's not the only invitation of why we come to God. But it is still part of the equation. See, we, we may have this tendency to see our challenges inaccurately. An outlook always determines outcome. May Scripture be the outpost of our outlook, our perspective on life. May we see circumstances and situations and relationships in light of the reality that God is our God. And He's creator. And He's tough. He can handle it. He can handle it. Whatever's coming for you in 22, He's got this. Trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him. When we see God as creator, we have to squint to see our problems. Now I shared with you this morning that we've been given two invitations with one warning. Here's the first invitation. You're invited to gather with the people of God, to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God, to really believe That your behavior of just choosing to gather with God's people on a Sunday morning matters. Not to sit back or skate in late and say, oh, the singing, I'm just going to be there for the video announcements and the teaching. No, I'm going to join in. I'm going to be there to sing. God's worthy of that. He's the creator. He's tough. He's mighty. He's my God. I am going to, in my life, prioritize gathering with God's people to sing. God is worthy of it. You see, why do that? Not only is he worthy, but it's to your benefit. You're tilling the soil of your heart to a lifestyle of thanks living, an attitude of gratitude. And gratitude is the soil of the heart that God bears good fruit in your life. So you're invited to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude. You don't have to. God doesn't need it from you. He wants it. But to be honest with you, it's more for your benefit, I believe, often than it is his. You're invited to gather with God's people to sing loudly with joy and thanksgiving and gratitude. But there's a second invitation here, and it's in verse 6. I'll go ahead and share with you this second invitation. We'll put it up on the screen. Here it is. You're invited. I love that word. Yeah, I'm invited. They know I'm alive. To group with the people of God to worship humbly before God. What do you mean by that? Look at verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Now to some, like my kids, man, I'm old. I'm 40. I had one of my kids come to me and go, dad, you're old. 40. I'm I'm three, dad. Yeah, I guess in that light, yeah. To others, maybe I'm not. But this is what I can say at 40. The most attractive and inspiring people to me are genuine and humble people. People that have nothing to prove. No insecurity to cover, conceal, or overcompensate for. There's so much freedom and humility. And this isn't due to an awakening of self-awareness solely, though I think that that's important. But in light of who God is, that's where humility comes. See, we've kind of spent time considering this, but God is God, the infinite being. No beginning or end. A couple of authors that I read this week, one is Spurgeon, another one by the last name Morgan, say this. In the presence, in his presence, man must bow down before him. Man must kneel in the attitude of complete submission. This is a truth which we need to remind ourselves of. Spurgeon writes, It's not always easy to unite enthusiasm with reverence. And it is a frequent fault to destroy one of these qualities while straining after the other. 
But that's the beautiful thing about living as a Christian. It's like it doesn't always fit in an outline. Like, man, I have joy, but also just the utmost respect for who God is and an awareness of who I am in light of who he is. See, when we gather on Sundays, that first invitation, we want to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. We also want to worship, to, to, to express that, God, you're worthy. Worthship. That's what the word means. Reverence. But it doesn't stop there. Listen to me. Tune into this. Sundays should set the pace for our Mondays. Sunday should set the pace for our week. That, that, that our worship and our praise leads to a lifestyle. Sets the pattern for who we are. You see, as a church at Coastline, we really believe by God that we are called to gather together to love God. That we're to group together, to connect together, and that we're to go to live on mission with the gospel in our worlds. Wherever God places us, we're there on mission with purpose, with intentionality, with very good news, with a lifestyle to back it up. That's who we are as a community. And the word worship that David is referring to here, I really believe it works itself out relationally. You see, when you group together, as we go together, as we do life together, worship becomes more of a lifestyle than a genre on Spotify or Apple or Prime. Does that make sense? Worship is a lifestyle of ascribing and prescribing to God in everything that we do, God, you're worthy. But listen to me. We don't do it alone. Verse 6 says, let us. Did you know that people only ever get healthy in groups? They don't do it well alone. You are not designed to live isolated. You're designed to live connected and in community. Why should we do this? Why should we group together? where we can actually be involved in one another's lives so that we can encourage one another to live in that atmosphere of worship like Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says. Why? Look at verse 7. Psalm 95 gives us the why. Look at what he says. For he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. See, listen to me on this. If we are to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God because God is both creator and tough, well then listen to this. We are to group together with the people of God to worship humbly before God because as our creator, he's caring and tender. We sing his praise because he's the creator, he's tough. We worship him because he's caring and tender. God is that perfect blend. He's the creator. He's caring. He's tough. And he's tender. And so as a community, we gather to sing his praises. And we stay connected. We encourage one another. We build one another up. We group together to say, man, I know what it's like to live that life as a believer. Did you catch the tone of the text there in verse 7? Where the people he watches over, the flock under his care. And don't you know that? Listen, I know life is hard. I know there's challenges and setbacks and things don't go according to plan. But God cares for you in light of eternity, not in light of the here and now. You need to get that lesson down. Because you and I have a limited perspective. Sometimes I forget that we have water just like two blocks away and then just not that far away. But then if I get a drone, I'm like, wow, we've got a lot of blue and green around here. You and I don't live with the drone perspective. We almost live like drones. Oh, this is the way it goes. But like God lives in that drone perspective. He goes, no, I know this is tough, but in light of your eternity, this is what's best for you. This is going to form what you really want, character, not cash, character, not convenience, Trust him. He cares for you. So worship him. 
Have your ears open to him. That's why he says in verse 7, if you would only listen. You see, this morning, we've considered our two invitations. I'm not going to put them back up for you on the screen, but I'm going to reiterate them verbally. Here they are. You're invited to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. That's verses 1 and 2. Second invitation, you're invited to group with the people of God to worship humbly before him. How? Through your lifestyle. That's verse 6. And both of these invitations are to be done in community. Let me say this again. Please don't miss this. Both of these invitations are communal. You're designed to be a part of a family. Let's see if we have anything in common. Was anyone here born of a woman? Man, look at that. We were all born into a relationship. Now, was it a good relationship? I don't know. Everything on this side of heaven is broken. So I don't know what everything was like there. But I do know this. You are designed to be a part of something that's relational. Does it always work out? No. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need heaven. Because this is never going to work out. What up there? One day. You're designed to be connected. You're invited to gather. You're invited to group. Why? Should I gather? Verses 3 through 5. Because our God is creator and tough. Why should I group with God's people? Verse 7. Because our God is caring and tender. That's who God is. But there's also a warning here. And it's how the chapter ends. Let me read to you verses 8 through 11 again. The Lord says, don't harden your heart as Israel did in these two different places in the wilderness. Verse 9, he says, Your ancestors, they tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. Verse 10, he says, For 40 years I was angry with them, and I said, They are a people whose hearts turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Now, if you want a good Bible commentary on this passage, I would encourage you to read the book of Hebrews, chapters 4 and 5. It's interesting. This is one of the largest sections of the Old Testament that's unpacked in the New Testament. And we don't have four more hours this morning, or else we would look at that and be like, man, this is awesome, and this is great. We don't have all that time. I'd encourage you to read your Bibles, because you know what? The best commentary on the Bible is Neil Spencer. No, is the Bible. Hebrews chapter four and five. It unpacks this beautifully of what this means for us as Christians. So there's your Thanksgiving Christmas assignment if you want one. But here's the warning that David authors, inspired by the Lord. As you go throughout your life, listen, this is so easy. Don't let your heart harden. It is natural to let your heart harden. Why? Because people are mean. Situations don't work out. Plans get foiled. And we have spiritual amnesia. I believe we all do. We forget the faithfulness of God. So here is the natural. If you just go through life on autopilot, your heart will get hard. It's going to happen. Welcome to the human race. Although God is great, people like the wilderness wanderers of the Old Testament started to put their trust in what they could see. Golden calves, that's who took us out. What? They complain for lack of leadership, provision, or discomforts. They backbite and they slander. That that was the wilderness wandering generation. And, And God is calling you in your life, listen, to go and to live on mission, not to go and live a life of murmuring. Why do I say that? Well, as we close this morning, I want to read something to you from an author who I found to be ever so helpful and insightful. 
but he had a lot to say. So what I'm going to do is actually put it up on the screen and read this to you. Because as we're getting to the close of this time together this morning, it's very easy to just kind of go, goodness gracious, how much more words can we listen to? But listen to this. I think this is insightful and helpful. The author writes this. After the Lord had set his people free from their bondage in Egypt, after he had parted the Red Sea for them, they found themselves hot and thirsty. They could have trusted God. Instead, they murmured and complained. The result, pay attention to this, was a hardened heart. So too, at any given moment, I'm either going to be worshiping or murmuring. Thanksgiving leads to grace and glory. Murmuring, on the other hand, leads to discouragement and depression. Murmuring will take us down faster than anything else. When do we murmur? More often than not, as with the children of Israel, it's when they're going through a dry spell. And when we're dry, we're so vulnerable to complaining. Don't let that happen, says the psalmist. The Israelites had seen God's work. So have we. We have seen him save us from hell, take up residence in our hearts, adopts us as sons, and plant us in his kingdom. Therefore, regardless of how dry the day might be, we have more than enough reason to rejoice and worship him enthusiastically. The tendency to murmur that began in the dry days at Meribeth seemed to set a pattern for the children of Israel. Soon they began to murmur about everything. It was murmuring that eventually kept them from their destiny for when they were camped at Kadesh Barnea on the very border of the promised land, they believed the report of the 10 spies who complained that the giants were unbeatable rather than realizing that no man was a match for the God who had parted the Red Sea. Murmuring is like cancer. It just begins to spread and take over. How can we keep from murmuring? What is the cure for murmuring? Worship. Worship. So how do you replace a bad habit? Well, you know what you do. You insert something good. I'm going to read something to you from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 20, that talks about how we should be speaking. Paul wrote this, and he says this, Be careful how you live. Like there's things out there that are going to get you. Like the other day I was on my bike riding through... Uh, Andrew Jackson Trail in National Seashore. And there was this massive snake, huge snake. And I didn't think, oh, I'm just going to do whatever I should, you know, I'm just going to go for it. God's with me. I'm just, no, you know what I did? I, I sped up on my bike, went as far away from that snake as I could, and just put my head down and pedal, 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 pedal. <laughs> I got to pay attention. I got to focus. I got to get past this snake. Listen, there's things out there, attitudes, certain people that you got to go, I got to stay away from this person. This one is negative. Everything that comes out of this person's mouth is no, no good. So this is what he says. Be careful how you live in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Don't live like a fool, but like those who are wise. Okay, tell me what to do. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because it will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what will that look like? I'll be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God, the Father, and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What we do with our words matters. Does everything go your way? No, welcome to life. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Why? You're sowing the seeds of what will eventually produce called a hardened heart. Happens slowly, over time. Like casting crowns, it's a slow fade, if you know what that is. It happens slowly. Something doesn't go the way you think it should. So there's a murmur. There's a complaint. And then you set a pattern. You know this phrase. Sow a thought, you reap an action. Sow an act, you reap a habit. Sow a habit, you reap a character. Sow a character, you reap a destiny. Ralph. Waldo Emerson. Listen, as we close this morning, why do I share this with you? Because I'm bored, I don't know what else to do on Sunday morning. No, I got six kids. 
and a bunny that my kids won't leave alone. We're trying to figure that out. I want you to do well. I really genuinely do. I want you to live well. I want you to be full of joy, peace, kindness, goodness, mercy, self-control, long-suffering. I want you to enjoy everything that God has for you. I want you to do and to live like Jesus said, I've come so you can have life abundant. I want you to be like that tree in Psalm chapter 1. Man, just over time, fruit in its season. The tortoise always wins, not the hare. Learn that lesson. Yes, life is short, but it's also long. Play the long game. Make good decisions and trust God. How do I make good decisions? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Know his word. It brings instruction and correction. And in this psalm, we are given two invitations to accept or deny. Number one, you're invited to gather with the people of God to sing loudly with joy and gratitude to God. You're invited to do that. Why should I? Because God is creator and tough and he's your God. You're invited to group with the people of God to humbly live a lifestyle of worship before God. Why would I do that? Because God as creator is also caring and tender. Yes, he's the creator. Yes, he's tough, but he's also caring and tender. And as you go throughout life, Live on mission with God, not murmuring to or about what God is or isn't doing in your life, but trust Him. You don't see the end from the beginning. You don't know all that God knows. You know what you know? You know what you know. That's what you know. And me too. So I'm going to trust someone that knows more than I know. His name is Jesus. And suffering is a part of his plan for your life. Read the book of James. Say, what do you mean? Like God doesn't always want everything to be rainbows and roses? No. He wants you to develop. And Suffering does that better than any other. You want to do well in light of eternity. That's what you want. Whether you can articulate that or not, or you're willing to admit it, that's what you're designed for. So how do we close? This is how I would entitle this message this morning if I were to give it a title. Gather, group, and go equals the good life. What do you mean? Gather to love God. Group to connect together. And go to live on mission. That's what Psalm 95 is about. And so that's why last year I wanted to evaluate that. Did we do that? Did we gather, did we group, and did we go, and how did we do? I want to know what that's like in our groups, in our gatherings. You may have missed this from a month or so ago when the communications team put this together, but we wanted to give an overview of, God, what are you doing in this community? Because that which we don't evaluate, then we don't really value. I, I, want, I want to do well. I don't want to waste my time. I don't know how much more time I have. I want to make sure that like, I was able to serve those who I was told to serve. That's what this is. This is a platform for service, not to be seen. And that's the heartbeat of the church that you're a part of. To see new life in Jesus all along our coastline. How? By communities who gather, group, and go to love, connect, and live on mission. That doesn't sound fast. That doesn't sound flashy. No, it's not meant to be. It's meant to be biblical. It's meant to be sustainable. Because heaven is coming. I really believe that. I really believe that Jesus will return. When? He didn't tell me. I wish he would have, but I only know what I know. I do know that it all works out. That's what it says here. But I also know that just as God is gracious and kind and forgiving, he's also just. And sin must be judged. And I know that everything on this side of eternity will burn. Have you read the book? 
That house that you're building, that's awesome. Keeps you dry, keeps you warm. It's not going to last, though. Don't live for it. Live for a home that's not built with hands in heaven. That's where you want your treasures stored. I want you to be able to turn thanksgiving into thanks living. Why? Because it's the best thing for you in light of eternity. And that's what you're designed for. That's the good life. It's the God life. So as we close this morning, I just want to give you the invitation that's in the Bible. You're invited to gather with the people of God. You're invited to group with the people of God. You're warned not to go and murmur, but to go and live on mission. You're invited to sing, to worship Him, to go and live well in Jesus' name.